All right, your next project is all about network scanning. Um, believe it or not, if you don't know this, pretty much everything's web enabled now. Everything is internet based. Yes. No. I know it's, it's it's amazing to some people. Yet we do have some students without internet access. I got somebody one of my online classes who does not have internet. That's uh, that's, that's right. interesting. Um, now, I mean, actually, it was <laughs> two semesters ago. We actually had a student that. Every day I would come up here, he'd be sitting right out here on the steps using the internet. Because he didn't have internet at home. So. He could have come into use a lab. Well, he was up here. Week, I, I come up on a weekend when the whole place is closed. Oh. He'd be sitting outside using the internet. Okay. That's still better than But that's fine. <laughs> but, uh, all right, so we're going to talk about how this works. Okay? I have a program here called Wireshark. Okay? If you don't have it, you need to get it. Okay. Now, I'm going to give you a little... Warning up front. With this project in Wireshark, when you install it, you have an option for what's called a Win PCAP driver. Win PCAP driver is used to capture traffic. Do not install this at your work. <laughs> Some places will be very upset with it. Okay. Bro State, you know, they know I do this, that's fine. But they can detect it. Because what it does, uh, Hopefully, everybody has had some sort of intro to networks class. You know how our network cards really only accept the packets destined for our machine? Well, the WinPCAP driver puts our machines in what's called promiscuous mode. Makes them accept everything. So every packet on, the net, on our segment of the network is then brought into our machine to be analyzed. Okay? If you install this at work, like you tinker, some other agencies, they can detect it. Because they can detect when a machine's in promiscuous mode. And you could get into a large amount of trouble. Somebody, um, can you stop that? Stop making noise. Stop it. Do we need to call your mom? He's playing with a plastic cup. I'm trying to listen. Stop, Roy. Stop or leave. Children? Jeez. Okay. Uh, so they can detect it. Uh, somebody, I forget who, was telling me that they were actually doing some of these projects. Now, this project specifically has some data in it about bomb making. <laughs> <laughs> and if you follow some of the links and stuff at your work, they might have an issue with it. Because who, somebody contacted me, they got, they were notified, hey, what are you doing serving bomb making websites? So just be careful with what you do. Okay. Um, you can install the program without the WinPCAT driver and analyze no problem. I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay, you're going to get a, a PCAP file. Okay, now uh, PCAP is the extension for it. That means it's you know capture file. So if you just click on the file and you have Wireshark installed, it actually just comes right up into Wireshark and shows you all the packets and you can analyze it and do everything. Pretty simple. Okay. Do you not have when PCAP, if you do not have Win, Wireshark installed, you won't be able to view that. So you need something. There are other tools you can view it as well. There's even other tools where you could replay this stuff. Uh, when I was at University of Tulsa, the guy in my network security class created a file that had signatures of viruses on it. Then he just kept playing it over and over and over and over and over. And our job was to go write a program to capture it and analyze it and all that. You guys don't have to do that. <laughs> but uh, the point is, you know, you can just open this up in Wireshark. Wireshark used to be called Ethereal. Does anyone remember that? Ethereal, Ethereal, whatever. But I guess the guy got pissed. Now it's Wireshark. It's changed quite a bit. There actually was an update recently, which I did not install on this machine. It is amazing. I was actually talking to someone today about Wireshark. We could literally have a three-semester-hour class. I mean, three hours a week for 16 weeks just about Wireshark and barely touch it because it can do so much stuff, okay? So I'm gonna touch on a few things today it can do, but just so you know, it can do so much more. And the only way you're gonna learn it is play with it. Wireshark is evolving quite frequently, and you know I learn by playing with it. So I'm gonna show you a few things it can do, okay? Um, when you run Wireshark, and again, this capturing portion is what I'm gonna do now, just so we can analyze something. Don't do this at your work. If you want to do it at your house, that's fine. It's actually kind of cool. Run at your house, see what's going on in your network. Now, I'm going to start it right now. Can, do you all agree I'm really doing nothing on my computer at this moment? 
I'm not surfing the web. I'm not doing anything. So I'm going to click start, and I'm getting traffic. Okay, and you can continue down. The traffic keeps coming in. So why am I getting traffic when I am doing nothing? My network card is picking up all the traffic on my local segment. Picking up all the broadcast traffic, which there's quite a bit of that. And I think there was somewhere at the very top, if I remember right. Okay. Uh, actually, this Cisco SCCP, anybody know what that is? That's our phones. We actually have a phone right on the desk here. We're actually connected through the phone. That's why I'm getting all the Cisco stuff. So, But there's a lot of traffic, and there will be a lot of other broadcast in here. Okay? Host announcement, you know. So BS203 Lab 17. Okay? That's a machine. Of, why two? Okay, 203, yeah. Two, three. What it's doing is it's telling us the services it has to offer. All machines on the network every so often say, hey, I'm out here. Here's my name, and here's what I can do for you. And that's what that machine can do. It says I can function as a workstation, as a server, as NT workstation. In other words, it has different capabilities. Okay? Even though it might not be in it. Someone wanted to know who uh, WPAD was. Let's see what we got down here. These ARP <coughs> packets are kind of cool. I, actually, I'm going to stop the capture. And you stop it here by clicking the little stop button. ARP stands for Address Resolution Protocol. Yeah, this should be refresher for everybody. ARP basically says, okay, I need to know who so-and-so is. I'm going to resolve the address. And if you look at it, you see, now the way this thing works, you've got a window at the top. You got a window kind of in the middle that moves. See, we can move that. Then at the bottom, we have the results pane. Okay? There's no way I can get into every component of this, but the frame is actually the frame on the network. Okay? Then we have the Ethernet 2 frame. Then we have ARP. They, they vary by different packets. We'll look at a bunch of different kinds. Okay? So I can see that this is an IP packet. It's an Ethernet packet. And by clicking on these, you'll actually see it's highlighting different areas of the hex data. Okay? What, the traffic comes across as, as hex. And this program is just interpreting the hex. If you were to open that PCAP file with notepad or text pad or some, hex workshop, it would literally just be hex. But what's happening is Wireshark is analyzing this hex data and says, hey, 0800 at that specific position, I know it's hard for you to see, is actually an IP packet. Okay. So pretty simple to do. Now, there's not a lot of addressing stuff on this. Actually, if you notice here, you see the source address is 002564AD923A. Does anyone have a clue what that means? What is that? It's a MAC address, okay? So what it's saying, the source address is that. The broadcast address is this F, 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 F. That's the broadcast. That's the destination. What it means is this machine is sending out a request to everybody on the network. That's why I received it, because it was a broadcast. So whoever sent it out, I picked it up because it was a broadcast, okay? Now, um, you can also see up here, you know, it's asking the question, who has 10.50.200.37? Tell 10.50.200.49. It's kind of like saying, hey, does anybody know John's phone number? And whoever knows John's phone number would then tell me who John's phone number is. So the ARP request is asking the question, hey, does anybody know who this machine is or who belongs to this IP address? And at that point, someone will reply with the information, and then the machine will make a unicast request from that point on. There's a bunch of different types of traffic. There's broadcast, which everybody gets. There's unicast traffic, which goes to a specific person. <coughs> okay, and we're going to see some. All this so far is, for the most part, broadcast, because or from my, my phone. Okay, you see, there's tons of it in there. A lot of this rebroadcast stuff is from the phone. You'll see it's all this Cisco SCCP. Okay, there's just tons and tons and tons and tons of this. Well, that, I don't know why that phone's rebroadcasting so much. Okay. So I'm going to start another capture here, and really the b easiest way to do it, since most of us now have multiple interfaces, we'll have a, like a wireless plus an Ethernet. If you go to capture, then go up to interfaces, you'll see whatever interfaces are available on your phone. This one has a Bluetooth and then a local area connection. Look for the one that the packets are increasing. 
This is if you want to do a sample at home. Okay. So I'm going to say, aha, this local area connection, this gigabit network card is increasing, so I'm going to click start. I'm going to say, whoa, you didn't save your previous stuff. That's fine. Continue without saving. I don't want it. Now, I'm going to do a couple of different things. I'm going to bring up a command prompt, and I want to show you a couple of different types of traffic. First, I'm going to show you. Everybody heard of FTP before? Oh. I'm going to type FTP, FTP.nei.com, which is actually Network Associates, which is McAfee. So I just know they have a site. Then I'm going to go username anonymous. And my password is ken at here.com, which is bogus, but it works. I'm actually in their system. I'm just going to do ls for list. I'm going to go into uh, let's license. I'm going to go in there, and I can look and see they have antivirus. And I, I'm doing ls for list, cd for change directory. Now I can go into dat files. And then I can see go into 4.x. Then there is the latest change to whatever their fire signature file is right now. So all I did was I connected into them, and I'm just looking around their system. Okay, that's all I'm doing. Okay, now when you're done, you just do buy. Okay, so I'm going to stop my traffic here. So I should have a bunch of traffic at this point. And if I cruise way down here somewhere. I should see some FTP traffic. I should see some FTP traffic. Why am I not seeing any? Whoop, oh, there was some. Oh, wow, why am I getting so many retransmits? Okay, there we go. I got some. Okay, right here you'll see I actually said goodbye. Now, this is making this very hard to do with all these retransmissions. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort by protocol. I'm going to click up here on protocol. And now all my FTP is together. All I did was sort it by the name. Just like in Excel when you sort a table. That's all I did. So all my FTP traffic is now the same. Or is all together. There's my DNS. There's my FTP. Okay. Now when you click on these, you can actually look at the bottom and the data will change. Okay. Now I want to look down here at the bottom. Down here we have TCP, which is the type of packet it is, the TCP packet. Okay. Some of the stuff you can read down here, first of all, we can see our source just like I showed before. And actually, I think I can show it better here. I can show you my source and my destination. Source and destination. I wish there was a way to make this bigger. I just don't know how to do it. Sorry. So, uh, yeah, but I don't know. Will you be able to see it? Let's see. Where's Zoom on this darn? Can you? Yeah, that's finding. That's not zoom. Oh, that one. Let's try it. Oh, there we go. We got it. Is it bigger now? Okay. Bigger now so we can see it. Okay, good. All right. So I didn't even know you could do that. Okay. So source and destination. You'll see them right here. Okay. My source is a Dell. My destination is a Cisco. Okay. Let's talk about those for a second. So what this is saying is it came from a Dell machine, which was most likely mine. Who was I talking to? McAfee. Remember, I FTP'd into McAfee. So the source, and if you actually, look, which packet are we on? We're on packet 3012. We're actually on this top packet right here, okay? So you'll see, I know it's hard to see now, but the source, actually maybe I can widen these columns out a little bit so you can see them a little better. Okay, so we're looking at packet 3012 right here. So you'll see the source address is 10.50.200.166. What well, is that me? I want to know. So I'm going to do IP config. That's me. 10.50.200.166. So we know that's me. So the source is me. The destination is 198.63.231. Let's. And the way you can check that is you can do what's called NS lookup, stands for name server lookup, ftp.nei.com. And so that's the for name server lookup for that address I connected to, and it was 198.63, so on and so forth. And you'll see 198.63.231.45. So that is the correct information. Okay. But on here, you see, so you see a source. It shows my MAC address, and it shows the destination. So obviously, this is my MAC address. You all agree with that? Mm -hmm. If I was to bring up 
IP config down here, if I did IP config slash all, you should be able to see a MAC address of my Ethernet connection. And it's 001583420E0F7. So, was oh, that the right one? Yeah, that's, oh, sorry, this is the one I want. That was my Bluetooth. Okay, we want this one. The last two digits are 7985. Y'all see that? So if I go over here, the last two digits are 7985. So that's obviously correct. Now, the reason we're working with a MAC address is all machines talk one-on-one. -on -one. They do what's called a unicast request between them. So obviously, if my destination was McAfee, then obviously this is McAfee's MAC address. Does anyone agree with that statement other than Roy? Why is it not? Anyone know? Right. I cannot. Well, wait a second. So if that's not McAfee's MAC address, yet looking at my packet, that's their IP address up here. So why is it telling me that the destination is the Cisco machine and that's the MAC address? The reason is, on the Internet, you can only talk to your next hop or your next router. So that is the router out of this building. Then that router talks to the next router, which talks to the next router, and sooner or later it's going to get all the way to McAfee's. So pretty much any address I'm trying to connect to outside of Rose State, what are their addresses going to be? All going to be that same router, because I have to go outside. Internally, you know, they're different. But if I was to do that ARP, then if I did dash A, I can actually see my ARP table. This is the machine my... This is the table that my machine knows about. It knows about all these systems on the network. And one of them, let's see, what's that? Mac, it ends in 3, E3, 3F. It's actually right here. See that top address right here, this top one? Okay. Right, that's my gateway. That's the gateway out of, it's actually the switch upstairs, or the router. Our switch kind of acts as a router. It's the one upstairs in our building. So even though I'm trying to connect to McAfee, I'm really talking through a machine in this building. Then that's talking to a machine in the admin building, which then talks to one downtown Cox, to which it goes to however many hops. And you can actually do something called trace route, T-R-A-C-E-R-T, -E which I cannot do in here. If I did trace route, this is something cool to do at home. If I did that right there, if I was outside of Rose State, it would actually show me my router, then the next router, then the next router, all the way to McAfee. I'm not going to be able to see it here because Rose State blocks that because it uses the ICMP protocol, and you can actually take down networks if that's used the wrong way. So what happens is Rose State blocks it. So I'm really seeing Rose State's routers. It's not showing me the results of that test. Okay. Well, I tried that at home. It should tell you all, all kinds of information. Okay, so let's continue on. So we have an FTP packet here. We could see the source. We could see the destination. We see which type it is. And you notice as I click on each one of these, see like that source ad or destination address right there comes from right there. That source comes from the next section. The type comes from right there. The IP is Internet version 4 comes from right there. So wait a second. How... Does it come, how does 45 become 4? It's actually just the first portion of the hex address. It, it doesn't need more than that, okay? Because you'll notice, see how that's a 4? And see how it's highlighting 45 down here? I want to click on header length. That 20 bytes is still on the 45 down here. What it's saying is it's not using the whole data for that. It's not too critical for this project in this class. I actually, in pen testing, I cover that a whole bunch more in depth. Okay, but we can look at different things, like there's a bunch of flags, okay? This was a big area of contention on the project in the other class. Flag is either on or off, okay? Uh, when, way back when I used to teach intro to networks all the time, uh, we used to eat it. Remember Poncho's Mexican Buffet? There's still one <coughs> on the south side. Anyone ever been to there before? I've been there. Yeah, yeah. Poncho's close to I love. Okay, they used to have one on 29th Street, but that's closed now. But Poncho's, you basically, it's all you can eat Mexican food. You'd walk through, get your food, sit down, then hit a flag on your table. You'd raise the flag when you want more food, lower the flag when you don't want any food. That was actually a bubblegum shrimp 
last fall. And they had the run for us, run, stop for us, stop. These license plates on your table. When you want something, you do stop, and they stop and help you. When you're done, you switch it back to run. So that's kind of like a flag, on or off. There's a lot of stuff on a network that's that way, okay? Like reserved is a zero, which means this packet is not reserved, okay? Don't fragment set to one, which means, yes, frag this, you know, don't, do not, yes to don't fragment, you know what I mean? Okay. But you can go on. You don't have to know all that in great gory detail. Okay? Time to live is 128. Okay? What that means is whenever a packet's sent out, depending on your OS, the time to live is set. Um, every time a packet goes through a router, that number is decremented. So it goes through the first router upstairs, it's now 127. Then it goes 126. It keeps, every time it goes through a router, that way if it gets lost on the Internet, sooner or later it's going to hit zero and be deleted. If you didn't have a time to live, that packet would just be cruising on the internet forever. So, there's actually a, a, about a five-minute movie. It's called Warriors of the <laughs> dot .net. Yeah, I've seen that video. Right, if you haven't Twice. seen it, it's, it's kind of interesting. It's called Warriors of the dot .net. It's really cool. It kind of shows you how the internet works. It's got the dreaded thing of death, and it's real mm -hmm. graphical. So it's kind of cool. But it's you the can animation ever. <laughs> yeah, it, it's old. Okay, so you can look at all kinds of different things. I'm going to close down a few of these areas here, okay? So under TCP, we can see ports as well. Ports, think of it like a TV channel, okay? What port is something working on? Now, this is an FTP packet. What port is FTP? 21 and what? 20. FTP is actually two ports, 20 and 21. <laughs> Okay, you have the control and you have the data. Okay? F the 21 is basically do this, then 20 comes back with the results. Okay? So that to be actually has two. And if I was to go through different packets here, and if you just watch that port, let's get it so that port's on the screen. Okay, watch that port right there. Watch that. 21, 21, 21, 21. Sooner or later, I know I transferred something, didn't I? No. Oh, I never did, did I? I didn't actually transfer any files. Well, crap. So you're not going to see a 20. <laughs> All I did was I was doing list. I never actually transferred a file. If I had, you would have seen the 20. That would have been the data. Sorry, I didn't even think about that. But good, yeah, didn't even think about that. Okay, but you have a source and destination port. Let's talk about why those are different. Okay, it's kind of like the Internet works on port 80. You all agree with that? HTTP works on port 80. So I am talking to them on port 80. So I surf Google, goes out on port 80. Does it come back on port 80? No. no, it comes back on a port greater than 1024 normally. Same with FTP. This one came back on port 2413. Okay? So what that means is I sent, I made a connection to McAfee on port 21. Their FTP machine answered on port 21. Then when they replied back to me on port 2413, okay, that port varies with each connection. Okay? All right, let's see what else we can see in here. You can see sequence numbers. Now, this is actually kind of, kind of critical. A sequence number is a random 32-bit number. When you start communicating, so when I started this lecture today, I would have picked a random 32-bit number. Then every time I told you something, I would increment it by one. So I would have gone up quite a few numbers at this point. But that's the way it works. When you start trans, you know, watching Netflix, you make an initial connection. It gives you a random 32-bit number to start. Then every time it send, you, know, you send it a packet or it sends you a packet, it increments the number by one. That way you can put them back together later. Okay. So now that being said, what is the sequence number of this packet? Can I see it? What is it? Come on, it's right there in the middle. Anybody? 155, you all see that? 155. So if it's a random 32-bit number, 32 is a very large number. What gives? Is that a large number? No, that is not a large number. Let's see if it actually increments. Well, that's not there. We need to go to another packet. 
So sequence number, well, I need to shrink this bottom area a little bit. So sequence number is 927, 950. So they are changing. Remember, I sorted it. That's why they're not quite in order. But you'll see they're changing, but none of them are very large. Well, does anyone know why? You notice the word relative? What that means is it's a relative sequence number. I don't like this about this program. I'm going to show you how to fix it. But what that means is when I first made a connection to McAfee, it said, okay, that first packet is sequence number one. Second packet is two. So it just makes it easier for me to see. But that's stupid. Okay, uh, now under File, under Edit, yeah, Edit Preferences, you can actually go down here to Protocols, Find TCP, TCP, then you can find over here where it says Relative Sequence Numbers and say, stupid, turn that off. Okay, now what happens to those numbers? Now the sequence number is a massively large number. That's the real sequence number. Okay? The relative is nice. What it, the program's doing that for me? It's like, you know, this, this session started, so we're going to start one and two. But in reality, it's not that number. It's this big, long one. So that's the one you're going to want in the... Right. I want the real one. I don't want the fake one. Okay. I want the real one. Okay, you understand the difference. See, that is a 30 bit do bit number, it's a huge number. Okay, and it's actually this hex data down here. If you converted hex to decimal, that's what you would get. Okay, now I'm going to set it back the way it was, just in, you know, so you can see again where that was. So, under preferences, protocols, TCP. I just don't like it. There's certain things. It's kind of like hiding file extensions in Windows. Why? That's stupid. Why would you do that? But Because that's not really the correct sequence number. I mean, 927 is not the correct number, but that's what they use. So. Okay, so there are sequence numbers. There's some more flags. Not critical to this project, but it was to a different class. Now let's get down here to the bottom where it says FTP. Okay, File Transfer Protocol. What this is, this is the actual data or the commands that came back. So the answer was transfer complete. See it right here on the right hand side? It also shows it right there. What username did I use? Does anyone know what it was? It was, was it anonymous? So I should be able to go up in here somewhere and find it. Let's find it. So I went here, and let's find it. Where is response command? Okay. Well, oh, that's why I sorted it, so it's going to be a minute. I'm going to have to search through here. Okay. Well, there is an easier way to do this. I can actually search for it. I'm going to go edit, find packet, and I want to do string... I want to search for packet details. Or no details. Yeah, that'll work. Packet details. And it should be able to search it. And it came up with this. Right here. It says username anonymous. You all see that? Okay. The command was user. No, was it prompted me for the username? My request, the argument that I entered was anonymous. You all see that? Okay. That was in packet 2675. Now, this is also kind of cool. Now, you'll see there's also a password here. You see that? So it says, username, okay, need password. Password required for user. Then I typed in kennethere.com or something. But, so where was the username again? It was, there it is. There's the username. Now, you can also, if you right-hand click on this, this is something that wasn't available years ago. You can do follow TCP stream. This is a pretty handy feature. So I'm going to do follow TCP stream, and what it's going to do is it's actually going to pull out that entire stream of data. So you can see, it asked for anonymous or username, then I entered the password, then I came up and did this, then I did list, then I did change working directory, you know, then I did list again. Again, I was typing ls, it converted it to nlst. I was typing cd, you know, and it converts it to cwd for change working directory. But you can see everything I did. 
So it's kind of cool. Kind of cool. Yeah. Kind of cool. Kind of cool. Just kind of. Of yeah, it does. It's, it's very, very nice. Now, what's here's where people screw up with this. Now, you'll notice my window. All of a sudden, I have a lot fewer packets to look at. Y'all see that? And they're all FTP. All that other Cisco crap is now gone. The reason is this filter box right here. See? What it is is actually filtering by stream number 144. Okay? What happens? Okay, great. I got the answer to that question now. The answer was uh, user. I don't know. Whatever the question would be. I need the answer to the next question. How the heck do I get it back? I mean, all my data is missing. Y'all realize it's pretty much... Well, one thing you can do... First of all, you can also go in here and do... Okay, when you bring this up... Remember, I had this up a second ago. I can actually filter this out so this stream no longer will be viewable. Okay. Or I can do clear, and now it goes back. It wipes that filter out. I will tell you, this project is, I hate to say this because people are going to, it's very easy. Okay. You should be able to do it in a very short period of time. But that doesn't mean wait till Tuesday at 445. <laughs> okay. But this should... This, you have 10 questions to answer, and that's it. <laughs> so Monday night. <laughs> the problem is if you have a problem with your program, you can't get the file to download, you can't get the program to open, you know, then it's going to be like, crap. You know, I had people contacting me yesterday. They were just starting the John the Ripper. It's like, you know, it's, I gave you two weeks for a reason. So I could literally make this one do at midnight tonight. In... If you figure out the amount of time it took you to solve John the Ripper and the amount of time to solve this one, yes, this one could be due at midnight tonight. It's that, you know the word relative? Yeah, this is the relative amount of time it will take compared to John the Ripper. Because, it's, see, in the past, this is actually the very first project where I'm actually using the same data from last year. Now, each project has been new this year. Well, it's the same data, but the questions and what you have to retrieve out of it is different. So it's different, but it's the same. What I've done in the past was I give you all this stuff and say, tell me what you can find. The problem with that is, right, what are you finding? What is she finding? What is he finding? It's different. And I was looking for certain things, yet I'm trying to make this class where, you know what, here's what I want. Let's go find it. That's not the best way of doing it. But at least it's easier on you guys. You know what I'm looking for. Yeah. And you're okay. Us what you want to know. Right. Exactly. So uh, there's only ten questions. Now let's look at a couple other packet types. So we looked at t we looked at FTP. I want to look at something where I surf the web because I don't want to do all that. I need a website that doesn't require a login. Um, I got one. If you've never been to this website, you need to go there. Oh. We, we need noise, I'm sorry. What is that? Welcome to Sumcom. This is Sumcom. This will be our background music. Welcome. You can do anything. Sumcom. This is Sumcom. Welcome Everything to Everything is possible. Sumcom. You can do anything. Sumcom. See? Is that nice? Anything at all. The only limit. Is yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you? Okay, but it keeps going on. Zombo okay. cons. <laughs> well, I guess switch with because it's still coming on the speaker. Well, it won't affect. I don't know how to turn those down. Okay, we're going to leave Zombo running for a second. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, I do a lot. Oh. And at the very end, it's like, buy a t-shirt. All right, so I'm going to capture another packet. Again, I could click start, and that will use the last interface. But if you're not sure, click on interfaces, find out which one's going up, click it, and then click start. I do not want to save. Hopefully, I'm still going to get a bunch of crap from the phone, aren't I? All right, we're going to surf some webs.
We're going to surf some webs. Yep, we're going to go to, uh, I know, yahoo.com. All right, now we're going to go over here to New Egg. Okay, New Egg. I went to a couple different websites. Now I'm going to click Stop. Okay. So you'll see I have a lot of TCP traffic here. That's the yellow for some. Actually, some of it's still secure. I still could be my phone. Um, so we're just going to look at some different ones. I'm going to click on uh, just the yellow. Well, I don't want the phone. There, there's some yellow ones. Okay. So in here, a lot of it's the same. You'll see under the Ethernet, I still have the source and the destination. Again, you'll see the source is me, 10.50.200 at 166. The destination is 204.79, wherever that is. But the destination address is really not theirs. Is it, it, why is it not there? You want to know why? Next hop. What? Hop. It's, yeah, our next hop is our Cisco router. So it, it's not ours. So I can look at that. Um, I can find out what the source is. Um, and you can actually even click on here. There's all kinds of stuff you could do. We're not going to go in very great detail. And, you know, let me pause here for a second. The whole point of this is um, we have a student, Danny Smith. Some of you might know Danny. Okay. Danny Smith was a really pretty good student. He, he also, he was the winner of the Oklahoma City Biggest Loser competition. So the prize was a free cruise. Or you get to eat all you want, so. But Danny graduated, and he actually did an internship at Devon. And it was kind of funny because, uh, you know, when you're doing an internship, you're kind of like a body, but you're not a body that's valued. It's like, you're here, we don't really expect you to do the hell of a lot, but hopefully you do something. Well, Danny found a problem on their network and actually went through the, I guess they reported kind of like in a wiki page or something. So he reported it. He saw something on the network and reported it and did all his paperwork. And like, okay, thank you very much. Keep doing your job. And went on and on and on forever. And then a few months later, there was a network vulnerability detected on their network. And they tracked it down to that same thing Danny found. And they're like, whoa, we got a problem here. And Danny raises his hand. Uh, yeah, I know. I reported that like three months ago. Everybody ignored me. And they're like, holy crap, <laughs> you did. Uh, so the point is, a lot of times you just look at traffic. Now Danny actually has a full-time internship going on at Devon with a guaranteed full-time position once he graduates, which is kind of cool. Uh, so, so a lot of times you got to look at traffic. You don't know what the hell you're looking at. For you guys, you know what you're looking for. But in the real world, what you do is you look for anomalies. And you can actually go in here, like I could say, okay, I want the um, IP.source equals, uh, what is my number? 10.50.200.166. So you can actually filter things in and out. Now you see it's only my packets. So you can do a lot with this tool, and you can even go in here with expressions and write them. You can say, you know, I want whatever the hell. I said, this tool is amazingly powerful, but there's too many, too much settings. I could go in and find, where's IP? I, that's not it, that's Apple IP. IPv4, I can see IP address equals something. Okay, but I, what I typed in was IP.source, because I wanted the IP source address to be mine. So you can actually filter out a lot. But in the real world, what you would do is be looking for, hey, that's kind of weird. And you would use automated tools, by the way. This is not an automated tool. It's automated and it views, shows you the traffic, but it's not analyzing it. It's just showing it to you. So in the real world, you'd be using HP OpenView or a bunch of other tools on the market. But at least you get an idea of what they're doing. But in the real world, yeah, people do. They just look at traffic. And, you know, I got called out by one of my clients uh, Chapel Supply, they used to sell pressure, actually they still do, they sell pressure washers and cleaning equipment and stuff. Well, they call me and they're like, man, our traffic sucks. What's going on? So how would you solve that? I said, well, I got Wireshark. And you know how I started the beginning of this lecture saying that really we can only see the traffic on our segment. And on a switched network, you only see the traffic going to you because we're switched. So what I did is I put a hub. I put a hub right between them and the outside world so I can see all traffic. Because a hub is not like a switch. A hub, you see everything on every port. That's what we used to have. 
it's kind of funny because in the past, years ago, hubs were everywhere and they were cheap. The switches were expensive. Try buying a hub now. You can't. They don't sell them anymore. I actually needed one for a job a couple years ago. I went to buy one at Walmart that was nearby. They sold a hub. No, it was the switch. I said, wouldn't work. I'm like, no, that's a stupid switch. But a switch segments. It's what I did on their network is I put a hub. You can actually do this at your house. Uh, basically, your cable modem to your router, just put something right there. Then you'll be able to see everything. It's amazing what's on those things. But uh, I put a hub there. Then I put my laptop. And you can actually go into Wireshark to set it up to capture. Uh, where is it at? It's under capture, options. You can actually tell it to go in and capture a certain amount of data for a certain period of time. Even. You can say capture for one hour. Capture for 100 meg or capture for whatever you want. So what I did is I went in here and told it to capture. I did like a morning capture. I did one in the afternoon. I did one at night. And uh, so I captured all these files and looked at them. It was amazing. There was this ton of streaming music. Kind of like the, 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 the stuff from our phone you saw. There was tons of that crap. So that was part of the issue. And it turns out it was the owner's son. You're gonna do. I mean, it's the owner's son. So I told him, and I don't know if they stopped him from doing it. And another issue was, they were real big on jokes. You know, you know, years ago they were more popular in email. Now they're not. At least I don't get as many. But everybody would send you a million jokes or a lot of little executable attachments you could play some stupid crap. Remember the dancing baby when that came out? Yeah. The issue was an executable. Mm -hmm. Somebody would get. It. What they would do is, they had a somewhat slow connection. It was all that was available at the time. So one person in the organization would get the dancing baby. Then would then mail it to every person in the organization. So but baby comes into the network one time, goes out to the external mail server one time, comes back in 50 times. Then those 50 people said, it's, it's just, I said, you're sending too much crap around your network. We, did, we learned that just by looking at traffic. Because you don't always know what you're looking for. That's why initially this project was tell me what you could find. But then it got to the point where I was looking for X and you told me Y. Yeah, you told me some, but it wasn't what I was looking for. And there were there are 4,000 packets. So now hopefully it's a little bit easier for you. I still made it so you had to still find the same kind of stuff. But you just have a little more guidance on what I'm looking for. So in the real world, yeah, you could use this to look at traffic. I still use it today. So, no, it's, okay. And there's other tools out there. There's actually a tool called TCP Dump and TCP Replay. You can use TCP Replay to put this back out on the network. Okay. You could use TCP Dump to actually capture traffic. But what's cool about that, you can tell it to capture only traffic on port 21 from this machine. In other words, you can give it really specific stuff you want to see. I used to use it when I ran my ISP. I had an issue with the chat room. <clears throat> uh, we had a chat service and it wasn't working right. So what I would do is I set TCP dump up to capture on the specific port that that chat room should be listening on. That I could see if anyone was actually communicating on that. So a lot of cool stuff you can do with it. But so the, your project is, you know, just analyze. Let's look at a few. So we got that TCP traffic here. And again, I could very easily, I'm going to clear this filter. Okay, so I'm going to pick a packet here. Now I'm going to, again, follow the TCP stream. And you'll see I have a whole bunch of stuff. You'll see this was a packet from MSN. You'll see what was happening. And you will most, there's the cookie. It actually set a preference for MSN and cookie. You know what cookies are? They're annoying. Yeah, they're annoying. But they're a necessary evil for a lot of places. Uh, a prime example of what a cookie will be. Uh, and Amazon's not really cooked anymore, but you ever been to Amazon and you surf a cat tree, for instance? Next time you go back to Amazon, hey, I know you looked at this cat tree, you want to look at this other thing. That's Which is like kind of annoying. Crap. What now? That's like clear all my crap. Yeah, right. But that's kind of what a cookie is. It's also like you have, if, you have, if you've never been to FedEx.com in your life, first time you go there, it's like, which country are you from? Okay, I'm from the United States. But you never have to set that again because it stores it in a cookie on your machine. Mm -hmm. So you can actually see cookies in here. 
And you can see the default location of the cookie. So there's a lot of stuff that you can even see when the cookies expire. Well, since I'm talking about cookies, it might be you know what cookies are. Pretty much everything I've talked about so far is on there. Uh, but you can see a lot of information. You can actually see the data. Now this is the ASCII data. If you don't know what ASCII is, it stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Basically a way to view data. But ASCII can only show a certain amount of data. Okay? Hence, you're only seeing part of it. Okay? Now if you look here at the bottom, you'll actually see there's a lot of hex data which is represented in this ASCII. So you really can't see a lot. If you actually switch to hex dump, now you can see it in hex, you can see it in ASCII, and you'll see that's what we were looking at a second ago, this stuff. You can do EPSDIC, which actually shows you a little bit more. You can do hex, you can do C arrays, you can do ROS. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can actually export this. You can actually export it out. You can actually extract graphics from here. We're not going to do it today, but uh, oh, a couple years ago in one of the lectures, I actually extracted a YouTube video from here. It's not hard to do. You do follow TCP stream, capture the hex data, go into hex workshop and paste. So you can very easily do it. If you were, you know, there's most likely a picture in one of this page, because obviously MSN and all the MED pictures. You could very easily find it, do follow stream, get the hex from the GIF or the JPEG, save it or put it in hex workshop and then see exactly what the graphic was. So a lot of cool stuff like that. Okay. But you can view this, and this is all the data that pertains to that specific stream. Okay? A lot of stuff is actually visible down here under TCP. You'll have the stream data. That, a lot of times, is the actual text component of it. Not always, but it really depends on what the type of packet is. Okay? That's not critical for this one, but that is there. Um, let's see what else is there about this. You all understand how the whole addressing works. Okay, it's pretty simple. You can also see the protocol here. You can see TTCP and also HTTP. Where did HTTP go? There it is. There's the actual get request. Okay, that's when I was getting whatever page this was. And since it was the beginning of the conversation, you see that's where my sequence number is one. You all know what an acknowledgement number is? It's the same thing. Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk to Adriel. So I start talking to him. When I, when I say, hey, Adriel, how's it going? That's sequence number one. Okay. He acknowledges, hey, Ken, how you doing? That's acknowledgement one. Then I say something else, that's sequence two. Then he acknowledges, and it keeps going forever. Okay. That's why you have multiple of those. Okay. All right. Then you'll, you'll see they do change. That's why they're all different. This is a grouping. Because what happens is, those are a lot of different web pages I looked at. And even though this was all based on MSN, you all do realize when you go to like MSN or Yahoo, it actually goes out to about 400 ad servers and analytic servers. Let's pull all this crap in, and then you're like, wow, that's a lot of stuff. So that's why you're going to get a lot of different sequences because it might go out and get this one ad or this one. RSS feed or this one piece of data. So each time it goes out, you're actually getting other data as well. Yeah, you get all kinds of crap on the machine. Okay. So very easy to use the filtering tool. Play around with that if you want. Um, if you want to see, I don't think you can just type in, actually you can. You type in just F FTP. Why is there no FTP? I didn't do FTP this time. Remember that was last time. This time was just TCP, but I could see just HTTP. I could see, let's see, is there any ARP traffic? Yeah, there was some ARP traffic this time. That's the whole, who is this guy? Please tell me. All that kind of stuff, okay? I could see DNS traffic. DNS is domain name server or system or services. It's the phone book. It's the name to the IP address. Okay? Now, there are a lot of other tools other than Wireshark. There's a, one of them, I can't remember the name of it. Um, it's kind of cool. It, um, you get off SourceForge. It, you can actually run the packet through it, and it'll extract all the graphics for you. Or it'll extract all the Word documents for you. So you can actually just take a network capture, just dump all the data. Because even though it's just a capture file, it still has all that data in it. 
still has every graphic that I downloaded, everything, everything. So, yeah, find some of those tools, play with them. What you do is you just open up your stream and tell it to export whatever, and it's just pretty darn amazing. I learned about it when I was up in Missouri teaching a class. This guy was playing with it, and I was like, wow. You can very easily capture. It's kind of scary. Put it this way. If I, say I put a hub between the business building and the rest of real estate. So I was seeing everything going on in the business building. I could run that tool so we can actually capture live data. So I can say, okay, capture live data, and I want to see graphics. But every single graphic that was going in and out of this building would just be saved to my hard drive. Isn't that kind of scary? Very scary. Very, very scary. Okay. All right, and, uh, yeah. Um, yeah uh, let's see what else is there. Um, I need to talk more about that after we get done with this lecture, but uh, remind me to talk something about capturing data. Um, Let's see what else is there. So I showed you a bunch of different kinds of data. I showed you how the search works. I showed you just a couple really basic expressions. There's nothing really detailed for this. It shouldn't take you all that long. Just, just jump on it, okay? All right, uh, and if you want to see the actual project, it's right here. It will open shortly for you guys, I think in like three minutes. Basically, hey, you got a bunch of suspicious traffic. You want to know what it is. Here's Wireshark or any other tool you want to look at it and answer the questions. Submit it in the quizzes. So there's the actual questions. I want to know sequence numbers. I want to know MAC addresses. I want to know, you know, what's the first name of the person with the last name Peoples, that kind of stuff. So what is the username that goes along with password one, that kind of stuff. So it's nothing really difficult, okay? As always, I probably have a typo somewhere, and Cameron will probably finish it first. <laughs> so, uh, can't find it. Yeah. Uh, and no, this time I think I'm perfect. But uh, <laughs> if you would, it actually makes it easier if you would actually answer the questions based on this document, and then don't open it until you're ready to submit it. The reason is, if you all go home and open it right now, it actually marks you as starting the quiz. Let's say I go and edit three questions. Well, you don't get the new questions. So it even grades you based on the old questions because you've already opened the quiz. So then I have to say, okay, who opened it before I changed it? And I have to go it back. It blocks all notifications for anything else on D2L. Yeah. For your, all your, your quizzes. Yeah. I, I, uh, can, you guys can see when I change stuff, can't you? Don't you get notifications of that? No, no problem. No, no. If I start that quiz, it blocks out everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it does? And oh, that's right. Everything. I forgot about that. Hey, I totally forgot class about that. that. I can't see anything. Okay, that's I give you all the questions. I mean, these are the actual questions from the quiz. Just write them down and submit them. So, well, not Tuesday. I mean, Cameron will probably be done with it by tomorrow. He's kind of anal like that. He likes to get it done right away. So, once he's done, tell you, once Cameron finishes it and he's, I've graded it, make sure it works. I will then let you all know. Okay, Cameron's done. It's been checked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What it is, because see, like D2L, not to, yeah, the quiz there has a lot of options. Case sensitive, case insensitive, regular expressions. Now I don't have them all perfect, and believe it or not, a lot of you submit stuff in bizarre formats, like um, the the steganography one. Someone had periods at the end of every one. So it was like, you know, the file name dot jpeg period. I wasn't looking for prayers. I screwed it all up. And it was <laughs> the finish line. Come on. The tortoise and the hare. I got everything from rabbit and bunny to tortoise and the hare. Or even Papa John's. Pizza, you know, the Papa John's. Papa John's with an apostrophe. You know, uh, like 40 different ways of saying it. So I do my best to anticipate it, but you always amaze me. <laughs> so, and the normal problem is I like I had regular expressions turned on, which then becomes in case insensitive, or I didn't have them on, that kind of stuff. I think I got these all correct, <laughs> but I usually don't. So, all right, yes. And are you going to talk about the exam? Yes. Okay. Let me stop this, and we'll talk about the exam. Okay.